morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to spend some time today talking about extraordinary ability visas and green cards in the U.S. Um, in particular, we're going to focus on the O1A, O1B, EB1A, and National Interest Waiver. A few things before we get started. Uh, this firm is a full-service immigration firm, um, but focuses on a number of different types of visas, including visas in the extraordinary ability category. Uh, we'll also continue our webinar series, doing at least two webinars a month on a variety of different immigration law topics. And at the end of this webinar, we'll send out a few things. One is a PowerPoint uh, that you'll see here today. Um, another is an Extraordinary Ability Visa Guide, which is a comprehensive guide, um, and a link to where you can sign up for additional webinars. Um, in terms of panelists today, we're very lucky to have G.A. Wong, who is uh, an, a senior associate at Scott Legal, who has extensive experience with extraordinary ability visas. My name is Kelly Wiener. I'm a partner at the firm, and I also process these visas regularly. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available. Um, and I also encourage everyone to check out our YouTube channel, which contains many videos um, of past webinars we've done um, and other um, informative videos on immigration law topics. So we will get started now uh, by talking a little bit about extraordinary ability visa categories. All right, so let's start with by talking about the O1A visa. This is a non-immigrant visa, meaning it's a temporary visa for individuals with extraordinary ability in the sciences, education, business, or athletics. And the standard is a person who is one of a small percentage who's risen to the very top of the field of their profession. Um, so a very high standard. Um, there's also the O1B visa, which is for um, non-immigrants uh, who are, so again, a temporary visa, um, who have extraordinary ability in the arts or motion picture or television industry. And there's kind of two subcategories there. So for the arts, the standard is the person must have received a distinct a distinction, meaning a high level of achievement as evidenced by a degree of skill and recognition substantially above that ordinarily encountered. And then the standard for motion picture and television is a bit higher. They have to show they've reached a level of acclaim substantially above that of his or her peers. Um, and then we'll turn to the EB1A green card. Um, so this is for people who want to live and work in the United States permanently. Uh, so, you know, the O1A and the O1B, you're going to get these for a fixed number of years and then you can renew them. Uh, the EB1A, that's when you really say, okay, I want to move to the United States. I want to live in the United States permanently and make that my main domicile. And so for the EB1A green card, very similar requirements to the O1A and the O1B, um, you know, extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics. So it's not broken out in, in terms of arts and other categories. It's, it's all combined under this one green card category. And the standard is a high standard. It's an individual who's one of a small percentage who's risen to the very top of their field and can show sustained national or international acclaim. Um, you also, in all these categories, need to show that you are going to be working in this area of extraordinary ability. So if you're saying, well, I, you know, I've had an amazing career and now I want to retire. I don't want to work anymore. I'm just going to get this green card. That's not going to work. Um, you know, you do have to include a statement explaining how you're going to actually continue your work if you're applying for the green card. And then if you're applying for a temporary visa, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the, in the next slides, you need to show that you have work in your area of extraordinary ability for the full amount of time that you're asking for. Um, we've also mentioned here the National Interest Waiver Green Card. So this isn't always talked about in the same, uh, you know, kind of uh, category as extraordinary ability. Um, however, it is a very good category for people who also qualify for extraordinary ability um, you know, GA will talk about this a bit more later in the presentation, but this is under the EB2 employment based green card category. Um, and you have to have either a master's degree or exceptional ability in your field um, as a threshold requirement to qualify. And then under this EB2 category, very often people will go through the PERM process where their employer will sponsor them for a green card. Um, you know, through, with a labor market test. For the national interest waiver, ultimately what the applicant is saying is, um, please waive that normal labor market test requirement uh, because I am in going to engage in or am already engaging in an endeavor that has substantial merit and national importance to the United States, that I am very well positioned to advance this endeavor, and that on balance, it's beneficial to waive the normal labor certification requirements. Um, so for people who have a really strong track record in their field or they're working in an area of significant importance to the United States, um, you know, this can be a really good option, uh, you know, if, if you 
feel I'm very accomplished, but maybe not quite at that EB1A standard. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the O1A requirements. Um, so for the O1A, you have to demonstrate that either you have received a major internationally recognized award, such as a Nobel Prize, a Pulitzer Prize, or much more commonly, people are providing evidence of at least three of the following criteria. Um, so receipt of nationally or internationally recognized prizes or awards, memberships and associations in your field, which require outstanding achievements, pub published material and professional or major trade publications about you and your work in the field, original contributions of major significance, authorship of scholarly articles, high salary in comparison to others in the field, participation on a panel or as a judge of the work of others, employment in a critical or essential capacity for organizations that have a distinguished reputation, or if none of these are relevant for your field, it's a very niche field or something, you also can try to argue other comparable evidence, but it can be a bit hard to do because you have to show that you cannot provide evidence on these other factors. Um, and so when you're looking at these qualifications, you know, you really want to think about um, exactly what they're asking for, right? So if you're a member of an association, like you're a lawyer and you pay a yearly fee to join a local bar association, that's not going to be enough because it's not an association that requires outstanding achievements of members in their field. Uh, so that is something that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, actually not just including everything about you, every professional thing you've ever done. For example, if you were, you know, in college and you won an award for being the best student or having the highest GPA, those things are really not going to be favorable for this type of application. Um, if, by contrast, you entered um, some type of competition when you were a student, but there were other professionals who had actually uh, you know, gone through this, uh, you know, competition and you were competing against professionals in your field and you won, then you could include that. The fact that you're a student doesn't preclude you from using that, but you want to stay away from things like student awards or things that are just like local to your school or university where you're competing against other students. Um, so you want to kind of think about that as you go through each of these requirements to see, you know, whether you might meet them or not. Um, especially for things like original contributions of major significance, um, you know, prizes and awards, like all, you know, employment in a critical or essential capacity. You want to also have the ability to have other experts in this area who are willing to write you letters of support. Some of these may be people you've worked with previously. So for example, um, you know, employment in a critical or essential capacity for an organization, maybe you're going to have, you know, someone who's at a very high level in your prior organization, speaking to your, you know, your leadership, how critical your role was, you know, what you were doing for that company, and also explaining how this is a company with a distinguished reputation. You also may want to have letters from experts that don't know you personally, maybe they've never worked with you, but they're aware of your work, they're aware of your work in the field. Uh, you know, they, they've they heard of you, um, they've seen your professional work, or if they see your portfolio, they're willing to, uh, you know, discuss it in a in a way that kind of verifies that other experts in this area are also believe that you have extraordinary ability in this field. Um, so as you go through each um, of these criteria, obviously, you know, three is the minimum, but it's better to meet more if possible. That being said, if one area is very, very weak, uh, perhaps better to leave that out um, because there is a, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but there is a two-part test where one, they will look at have you met the regulatory criteria? And then second, in totality, do you do they feel that all this evidence shows that you are someone of extraordinary ability? So you don't want to include anything that's going to kind of, you know, drop your profile in, in their eyes. All right, let's talk a little bit about the O1B visa. So this is the one that's focused on the arts and the motion picture television industry. Um, very similar kind of setup for the requirements. So, you know, either you have to be nominated for or have received a significant national or international award or prize in, this, in your field of endeavor, so an Emmy, a Grammy, and then evidence of at least three of the following. And as you can see from what's written here, these are much more focused on what would be relevant for the arts, right? So record of major commercial or cr critically acclaimed success. Um, you know, obviously these regulations were written quite a long time ago because they mentioned things like cassettes and compact discs and video sales. Um, so this is one where kind of other comparable evidence may be a bit more relevant because the industry has continued and some of the language here is quite out, you know, quite outdated. Um, but again, very focused on the arts, um, you know, leader starring role in productions or events which have a distinguished reputation. Um, so again, you want to be going through this and, you know, pulling out the things that are going to make you look the best. 
um, you know, and, and then as well, because it's a different type of, um, you know, like different type of field. Um, maybe there's kind of a niche industry you're in or kind of an artistic endeavor that has kind of grown, you know, become very popular. Um, so if you do have to use that other comparable evidence, you know, you can always kind of try to do that, um, you know, if you if you feel you're able to make that argument. All right, let's talk a little bit about the O1A and O1B differences. Um, so we've mentioned before, they have different fields. O1A is for science, education, business, or athletics. O1B is arts and motion picture, television industry. Um, you know, there are some fields where it's a little murky, where it's not really clear. What about modeling? Um, what about somebody who has a tattoo artist company? Um, what about a, uh, some, you know, a wine expert, a sommelier, like some of these, it's a bit, you know, murky where exactly it's going to fall. Um, when you can make an argument, perhaps for an O1B rather than O1A, that may be favorable. Um, because as you can see here, the standard for the O1B arts is lower than the standard for the O1A. So the O1A has that, um, you know, small percentage who've risen to the top of their field of endeavor, whereas the arts is distinction. Um, so if, if you can make that O1B argument, you may want to, to try that. Um, in terms of how long they're issued for, th those are the same. So you can get an initial visa approval for three years, or you can get an initial approval with USCIS for three years. And then you can get extensions um, in you know either one year, or if you're starting a new set of projects or a new employer, um, you can get three years. Uh, so technically, if you're trying to extend your 01, you're saying, I had this itinerary of projects, um, and now I need to finish them up, you're, the extension is going to be granted for one year. If you're able to argue there's a new employment contract, there's a new set of projects, it's not an extension, it's actually a, you know, kind of new, um, new employment, then you may be able to get three years, which, you know, can be favorable, so you're not having to go back, you know, each year. Um, and can your family come to the U.S.? Yes, they can. Your children um, who are unmarried and under 21 and your spouse are able to come to the U.S. on O3 dependent visas. Uh, they can attend school, the children and your spouse. Unfortunately, the spouse and children cannot work in the United States. So they, if they, your spouse wanted to work, they would need to look for another um, you know, work authorized visa category for themselves. All right, now we're going to talk about the EB1A green card. Um, so we haven't listed out the requirements here because they're essentially very, very similar to the O1A and the O1B. It's that same structure, either receipt of a major internationally recognized award or meeting three out of the you know, 10 criteria. Um, and for the, even though the regulatory language for the requirement is very similar, just because you've gotten an O1A or an O1B, it does not mean you will automatically be granted the EB1A. I think, you know, sometimes we have clients who come to us and say, well, if I'm on a certain temporary visa for a certain length of time, will it kind of automatically trigger my ability to get a green card? And that's not how the U.S. immigration system works. Um, essentially, you know, like, you can qualify maybe for an O1B, you know, under that distinction category. But then if you try for an EB1A, you know, the like the standard is somebody who has risen to the very top of their field, has can show sustained national or international acclaim. Um, so if you're somebody who kind of met that distinction standard, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to meet the EB1A standard. And similarly, even though the regulatory language for the O1A is more similar um, to the EB1A, they, they have a higher standard because this is a permanent ability to stay and work in the United States. Um, and so, you know, even when you're, if you get that O1A, you get that O1B, it's always a good idea if your goal is to get to the EB1A to keep building your profile, to keep working in that area, to keep gathering awards, um, you know, news, positive news articles, you know, things that are going to um, help you meet the criteria for the EB1A. Um, so as kind of just described here, Basically, the way that they approach these petitions is they'll examine the evidence to say, okay, do we have proof of prizes and awards? Do we have proof of memberships? Do we, do we meet at least the baseline of three um, categories with evidence in them? Um, and then they're going to do what we you know, call the Kazarian analysis. And this is a second step of the analysis where they consider the quality of the evidence in totality. So they're looking at all this to say, okay, if we look at everything taken together, when we make this final determination, is this someone that can fairly be said to be a small percentage of people who've risen to the very top of their field of endeavor? So again, you're kind of within your field, you're wanting to show, you know, if people Google your name, you know, you should be coming up. Uh, you know, that, that's, I think, something that uh, ultimately they, you know, 
different fields are going to have different levels of visibility. So that's always something that can be explained to the officer. Um, but it, it is something where, you know, they're looking for people that are kind of, these are thought leaders in the field. These are people that are likely going to have some type of digital footprint about what they've been doing in the industry if they really are one of the small percentage who's risen to the very top of their field. Um, and as well for the EB1A green card, um, you're going to be including kind of a statement that explains what you will be doing in the United States. So again, this isn't for people that are kind of saying, I'm done with my career, I'm pretty much just going to retire. This is for people that do plan to continue working in that area of extraordinary ability. It does not mean you have to keep working in your area of extraordinary ability until you die. Of course not. If you get, you know, you get the green card, you continue maybe however many years you're going to continue working. If, a, if at a certain point you want to change, you want to retire, you can certainly do so without endangering your green card. Um, but that being said, you know, people who are granted this green card are doing so on the basis of explaining to the government what they plan to continue doing, at least for the foreseeable future. All right, we're going to switch gears now, and GA is going to talk to us about the National Interest Waiver Option. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the EB2 NIW option. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, the EB2 NIW is also a green card category. So it will give you the right to live and work permanently in the United States if and when approved. Now, the big distinction with the EB2 NIW, which, you know, distinguishes it from the ordinary, you know, process of labor certification is that you don't need a U.S. job offer. You don't need a U.S.-based petitioner to, you know, drive forward to petition. So uh, the EB1A is also one of those categories where you can self-petition. The EB2 NIW is also another category where the foreign national themselves can self-petition for a green card, which is why there is a lot of synergy there uh, and you know the EB2 and IW can be uh, a viable al alternative to um, uh, you know some extraordinary ability individuals who can show a broad impact to their field. So let's talk a little bit about how you can you know um, explore eligibility for this type of green card. So the first thing to ask is um, do you meet the EB EB2 threshold um, requirement. So, and, and this EB2 threshold is a common requirement for either, you know, the EB2 ordinary EB2 um, pathway through a labor certification and employer sponsorship, uh, but also for NIWs, um, applicants also need to, you know, show that they meet the EB2 threshold. Now, the way to meet this is in two ways, so either one of the two ways. So you can either show that you have an advanced degree, which is defined as a master's degree or higher. So for example, a PhD would definitely meet that. Um, that requirement or even something like, you know, an MBA, uh, a JD, a Juris Doctor degree, or an MD, a medical doctor degree can also meet the advanced degree threshold because you typically need uh, a bachelor's degree in order to gain admission to those type of programs. Now, even if you don't have a master's degree, right, there is a way that you could qualify with a bachelor's degree. If you have over five years of uh, progressive work experience in your field following your bachelor's degree. So, a bachelor's degree in your field followed by uh, five years of progressive work experience can be seen as uh, an equivalent of a master's degree, and which is why you can um, argue that you have you, or you are the equivalent of an advanced degree holder if you have the bachelor's plus five years of progressive work experience. And how to prove progressive work experience? What does it mean that a work experience is progressive? It means that in the five years that you worked in, you know, either a position or a combination of positions, uh, your job duties and your responsibilities must have increased in complexity and increased in seniority. And you can show this in various ways through, you know, changing job duties, changing responsibilities, not how many people you supervised, or, you know, things like, you know, um, rising salaries, you know, uh, changing job titles from, you know, junior associate to senior associate, for example, that those, all of those uh, data points can be helpful in describing that uh, your work experience has been progressive. And USCIS will expect to see this progressive work experience substantiated by uh, letters, com confirmation letters from your previous employers uh, that really detail um, how your duties have changed. Now, let's say you don't have a master's. Let's say you don't have a bachelor's or, you know, you have less than five years of work experience after your bachelor's, then there is an alternative channel that you can use to potentially meet the EB2 threshold. And that is by showing that you have exceptional ability in the sciences, arts, or business. And we have discussed in detail about extraordinary ability. And it is important to note that exceptional ability is a very different standard as compared to 
extraordinary ability. So the exceptional ability is a much lower standard. It only requires you to show that you have, uh, you, you know, you're operating at a level that is significantly above what is ordinarily encountered, um, as opposed to, you know, an extraordinary ability where you need to show that you're, you've reached the very, very top of your field. Now, how do you show exceptional ability? In, in order to prove exceptional ability, the applicant must be able to uh, submit at least three out of the enumerated criteria here, um, which you know, includes things like any degree in your field, uh, a license, uh, if you need that to practice in your field, 10 years of full-time experience in your field, a high salary compared to others, um, and importantly, evidence of recognition uh, for your achievements in, the, in, in your industry by your peers, by, you know, professional organizations, by government actors, et cetera. Um, and it is really important, you know, to build up a volume of evidence that cumulatively will show that you are indeed are someone who is operating at a level significantly above that is ordinarily encountered uh, because similar to, you know, what we've been talking about, you know, in the EB1A uh, context, there is a, a two-step analysis. You would first show that you meet at least three out of the enumerated criteria, but also as a whole, the evidence evidence must tend to paint a particular picture of someone who is um, at an elite level. So now let's say you have, uh, you know, collected enough evidence to show that you meet the EB2 threshold criteria, uh, either through having an advanced degree or uh, having exceptional ability. The next step of eligibility analysis for the NIW uh, green card is that can you demonstrate that your application qualifies for a national interest waiver? And the reason why this part is important is because if you don't qualify for the NIW, then the alternative you have is to go through what is called the traditional labor certification process, right? So you would get a job offer from a U.S. company. The U.S. company would uh, test the U.S. labor market to see if there is any other qualified U.S. individual who is able and willing to take your position. And if so, um, the application cannot continue. However, if you qualify for the national interest waiver, you are exempt from going through that process. So even if there are other people in the industry who can fill the same job, do the same work, um, the uniqueness of your work or the, you know, the substantial impact that your work stands to have and the uniqueness of your skills, because of all of these things, um, the government is essentially saying, you know, we're giving you an exemption from going through this and you're basically getting a fast pass to you know, getting the green card. So how do you prove that uh, your application will qualify for an NAW? Uh, you would um, go through what is called the three prong matter of Dennis R test um, and the application must prove all three prongs. So the first prong uh, criteria is that the applicant must be able to prove that their proposed endeavor has both substantial merit and national importance. And what does this mean? So substantial merit can be proven in a wide variety of fields, uh, you know, including business, health, education, science, technology, um, and endeavors that tend to further human knowledge in those key areas um, can be found to have um, substantial merit and national importance. So some of these examples um, that, that the case law cites are medical advances, um, and improving engineering processes, improving manufacturing processes. Those types of advances have broader impacts um, beyond the immediate employers that you're working with. They tend to have such you know, um, broader impacts because if you're improving best practices in a particular field, those technologies can be disseminated to others through various, you know, um, various channels like, you know, publication of papers or patents or uh, just, you know, by, you know, influencing how others do the same thing in your industry uh, and could also have a strong positive economic impact by advancing a field as a whole. So the, the question that you want to ask when you're um, assessing your NIW case is what kind of future impact does my work stand to have and how can I show that that is important to the United States, right? And sometimes the U.S. government, um, you know, has promulgations of policies around certain areas like, you know, environmental sustainability or um, certain policy areas um, around AI or other key areas that is important to U.S. security or important to U.S. national interest. And if you can tie in your work through 
priority areas like that and really show why your uh, work um, not only will impact your immediate clientele or your immediate employer, but will uh, end up advancing the field as a whole and really substantially um, impact U.S. government priorities. Uh, that could be um, a very good case for uh, proving that your work has national importance. Now, the second criteria to prove is that the applicant must show that they are well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor. And in this analysis, the focus is on the individual, right? So the individual's education, the individual's work experience, the individual's uh, record of success in the field. So the government is looking for, has the individual done similar projects in the past um, that is analogous to the project that they are uh, proposing to advance in the United States? and what, were, what was the results of those kinds of um, previous projects. So if you can provide a portfolio of such a record of success in your previous professional experience, uh, then uh, you would be in a good place to meet the second um, prong. Now, uh, the third and last prong is that there must be a showing that on balance, it would be beneficial to the United States to waive the requirements um, of a job offer and thus of a labor, labor certification. And there are um, many different ways you can argue this prong. So for example, you can focus on prong one, national importance, and really talk about the broad systemic benefits that your work stands to give to the field as a whole that goes beyond, simil uh, that goes beyond simply benefiting your immediate employer or benefiting your immediate clientele. You can also rely on prong two and talk about the um, unique and irreplaceable skills that you bring, the know-how that cannot adequately be replaced with someone else with the minimum credentials in the field. And finally, um, there are some special considerations you can uh, highlight, uh, especially if you are an entrepreneur and if you will be creating jobs in the United States through your business endeavor, um, you can emphasize such substantial economic benefit to the United States that will outweigh the ordinary benefits of a labor certification, which is usually to protect the U.S.'s labor supply. But you can say that uh, your, you know, your, your business endeavor will provide countervailing benefits by creating a high number of jobs in the United States um, and advance that policy in a different way. All right, so we'll move on to the next slide. So let's discuss a little bit about expert opinion letters, uh, which are relevant um, in all of the extraordinary ability visa types that we have been talking about today. So expert opinion letters will be used uh, for O1 petitions, EB1A petitions, NIW petitions, and depending on you know the case strategy and the category of which you are applying, the purpose will be a little different. So for example, for the O1 or EB1A petitions, you would want the expert letters to, you know, describe your past achievements in the field, how your achievements have, you know, advanced the field in the past, and really to confirm why, why those um, previous experiences, achievements make you extraordinary. So those letters will be focused on proving that you are operating at a level that is highly above, um, you know, the ordinary. Um, you know, the ordinary level of um, achievements that you would find in that field. Um, about the NIW, right? So for the NIW, those letters can um, have different functions. So for example, some letters can be designed to um, boost the uh, national importance of the applicant's proposed endeavor. So for example, if you can get a letter of support from a government agency that is covering the field that you're operating in uh, and can really describe what is the need of, um, you know, in terms of US policy interests to have your particular uh, project um, contribute to the field and what is the uh, expected impact of your field, uh, impact of your endeavor to the field as a whole. So those uh, types of letters can help with the first prong, national importance. Other types of letters for the national interest waiver can uh, bolster your um, case for well-positioned. How is the individual well-positioned to advance this work? And those types of letters can talk about the applicant's past record of success in the field, talk about the projects that the applicant has has, um, dealt in the past and what were the impact of those previous projects uh, and how does this support that the uh, individual is well positioned to advance their proposed endeavor. Now, um, I think we didn't go on uh, several, um, can we just go back a little bit? Yeah. So another thing that you want to consider is uh, who is writing the letter, right? So 
Um, typically, you want to get letters from people who are well known in the industry, have uh, very impressive backgrounds, uh, to make the letter, uh, the opinions that are shared in the letter, uh, more credible to USCIS as um, mm -hmm. you know opinions from leading experts. And it is also important to have a mix of letters from people who know you and have worked with you in the past, uh, and also people who don't know you, but nevertheless are familiar with your work uh, because of your reputation in the industry. And those latter types of letters are called independent expert letters. And USCIS tend to rely more on um, independent expert letters in terms of the assessments of an individual's you know, caliber of work in the industry because they tend to think that independent experts can be more objective when they're talking about those types of assessments. Now, there is a place for inner circle letters, people who have worked with you and know you from the past, uh, when you're describing your, you know, for example, your previous achievements in a particular project and that person has worked with you in that project, uh, in eliciting details about that, getting letters from people who know you and have worked with you before can also play a very important role. So definitely work with your attorney to uh, develop the strategy of who can provide an expert letter and what function those expert letters will play. And with, with respect to the content um, in those experts' letters, um, Specificity is very important, right? So those letters are expected to contain a high level discussion of um, about your work, about the recognition that you've earned from your work, and ex you know um, importantly explain how this work sets you apart from others and why were the achievements important uh, for your field. All right, so now we can move on. So now then let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, some of the strategic considerations when you're trying to decide which category should I apply under. So the first question to ask is, do you want to stay in the United States temporarily or permanently? As Kelly mentioned earlier in previous slides, the O-1 visas are uh, non-immigrant temporary visas. Uh, by contrast, the EB-1A and the National Interest Waiver are both green card options. And really, uh, it will be well suited for people who do plan to live and work in the United States permanently. And if you, if you do have a green card, uh, this would uh, one day open up the pathway to citizenship. So if you're interested in that, uh, that could also be a consideration. Uh, another thing to uh, um, keep in mind of is if you are a permanent resident in the United States, um, you do also have responsibilities. And there are expectations um, on, you know, keeping a, a primary domicile there and, you know, physical residence requirements and uh, could be, you know, tax considerations as well. So definitely... Uh, a, a very variety of um, uh, factors can come into this decision of, you know, do you want to, you know, apply for a green card option or do you want a, per, um, a temporary visa option? Another important question to ask is, do you have a U.S. employer or agent to act as the petitioner for your petition or do you want to self-petition? For the O-1 categories, you do require a U.S. employer or U.S. agent um, to drive forward the petition. So the foreign national themselves cannot be the petitioner. So in certain cases, uh, especially if you are an entrepreneur and if you're applying for an ONA uh, through, your, through a business endeavor, for example, let's say you um, founded your own company in the United States. It is possible that that US entity legally can uh, be considered the petitioner and can be a distinct entity from the foreign national. So it could be possible for an entrepreneur to drive forward a petition like that. And if you're working under that uh, kind of fact pattern, definitely set up a consultation so we can discuss how that can look like. Um, uh, but in either case, there must be a US entity, a US employer, a US agent, a US um, uh, entity that, that must drive forward the petition. By contrast, for the EB1A and NIW green cards, um, the foreign national themselves are able to um, be the uh, applicants who drive forward the petition. Now, the final question to ask is uh, family considerations for the O-1 category visas. Uh, spouses and children uh, under 21 and unmarried can uh, join you in the United States on O-3 dependent visas, but unfortunately work authorization is not available. Uh, by contrast, the EB-1A and NIW both are green card um, 
um, petitions. And if you have a spouse and children under 21 um, unmarried, they can uh, join your petition as uh, derivative beneficiaries, and they also can be uh, eligible for the green card. And if you are um, applying for the green card through the I-485 pathway, the adjustment of status pathway, if you're already in the United States, um, each applicant for the I-485 uh, can apply for, you know, an employment authorization card and travel authorization card. And those benefits are also available for derivative beneficiaries as well. So that can be a significant advantage. All right, so then now let's uh, discuss some considerations when you are moving from a non-immigrant visa to a green card. The first question to ask are uh, about qualifications. So, uh, and we did discuss this a little bit in previous slides, but there is a higher standard to qualify for the EB1A, the green card option for extraordinary ability, as opposed to the ONA or OMB. Um, and especially because uh, the government looks at each category with a stricter eye, uh, given that it is for permanent residency. So qualifying for an ONA or an OMB does not automatically mean that you will qualify for the EB1A, um, even with the same file. Uh, so it it could be a good strategy to first get the ONA or OMB and come to the United States. And while you're in the United States, definitely um, continue building your portfolio to strengthen each category of evidence um, so that when you do apply for the EB1A, uh, you may have a better chance at um, you know, meeting the higher threshold. The other thing to uh, think about is timing. So consider how much time if is left on your current underlying visa, uh, because if you apply for an EB1A petition, if you apply for EB2 NIW petition, both are uh, immigrant petitions. So this can be taken in some in some circumstances as an expression of immigrant intent, uh, which can be uh, relevant when you're trying to extend or renew particular types of visas in which non-immigrant intent is important and is scrutinized. So as an easy example, uh, let's talk a little bit about the TN visa, which is um, a visa where uh, non-immigrant intent is quite strictly, strictly scrutinized. If you have a record that you have filed uh, EB2 NIW or EB1A, let's say a petition on I-140, let's say you have filed the I-140, and when the next time you go to the border and try to renew a TN visa, you may get a little bit heightened questioning about the non-immigrant visa intent piece because of that record. So definitely when you're you know, um, thinking of these different options and you're on a non-immigrant visa, definitely talk to an experienced attorney to uh, accurately assess the risks and uh, make an informed decision on when uh, strategically you want to go forward with those petitions. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, let's talk a little bit about family considerations and the timing considerations that can come into play. If you have children who may also need the green card, uh, you can consider filing early, um, thinking ahead of uh, potential issues at aging out, um, especially since some categories of uh you know, for example, the EB2 has, has been backlogged since 2022. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, it is not going to be a quick process. That's that's for sure. So uh, if, if you are planning on these things, um, definitely um, some advanced planning would be recommended. All right. Then we can move on to the next slide. So I believe this is the, the last topic, right? And the question is, are extraordinary ability categories available for entrepreneurs? And the answer is yes, for several reasons. Uh, first, the EB1A and NIW both allow for self-petitions, uh, meaning both are possible options for entrepreneurs who may not have a job offer from a different uh, company um, and may not be able to uh, avail of the traditional uh, pathway of labor certification through a job offer. Second, uh, there has been some changes made to the National Interest Waiver Standard under Matt of Denisar in 2016, which made NIW a much friendlier category for entrepreneurs. Um, so, so this definitely can be a, a viable option um, for entrepreneurs um, if you can prove, you know, a, a broad impact to your field uh, or to, you know, national priorities um, and, and meet the national importance standard. 
Uh, finally, uh, one thing to note is it is possible to apply for the ONA visa as an entrepreneur uh, if you have a separate U.S. entity, a corporation that you set up perhaps that can act as the petitioner to drive forward your petition. All right, so I believe that is all we had today. All right, so let's see if there were any um, questions. I believe there was just one question about whether the session will be recorded, and yes, it will be. Um, so I, yeah, so no other questions have come in, so we'll close there. So thank you so much, Jay, for, for sharing your time and expertise. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.